Music theory, the love of my life. Hi there, I'm Harry Lesson. A six string guitar and notes. Standard tuning, the G4 clef. Here's middle C or C4 on guitar. Let's go through the intervals of the C major scale. The distance from C to another C on the same octave is called a prime. It's really a non-interval, it's the same tone played twice. But it's still important to know the name of the prime. Between C and D is a major second, from C to E a major third, from C to F is a fourth, from C to G is a fifth, from C to A is a major sixth, from C to B is a major seventh, and from C up to the next C is an octave. These intervals define the natural major scale, also called the Ionian mode. You could start from any note, but for this example I have chosen C for simplicity and clarity. Also for relevance to the song I've been working on for the last two videos. So far so good. Now chords. The chords are made up of stacks of thirds. The common chords are triads, so called, because they consist of three tones, stacked from the root and thirds up. The chord C major in the key of C major is the tonic, the home chord, usually the beginning and the end of the song. C is the root of the chord, then one third above that we have the major third, the note that defines the chord as major or minor, major in this case, and then again one third above that we have G, the fifth. G is a fifth above C, the root, but a minor third above E, the major third. That's what I mean by thirds stacked on top of each other. Now I can continue stacking thirds on top. The next one would be B, a major third above G, the fifth, and a major seventh above C, the root. A chord such as this, consisting of four notes, is called a tetrad. The next third stacked on top would be D, a minor third above B, the major seventh. This is a major ninth above the root. This is called a pentad or a pentachord. Now we have two tones to play on the B string and that's not possible on guitar, so the common way to do this is to drop to fifth, since it has very little harmonic function here, and play the major seventh on the G string, like so. In this video I'll stick mostly to triads and a few examples of the most important tetrad the dominant seventh. The next note D, the function of this chord is the subdominant parallel, D is the root, F is the minor third, so this is a minor chord, and A is the fifth. On E, the dominant parallel, E is the root, G is the minor third, so again this is a minor chord, and B is the fifth. F, the root of the subdominant, A is the major third, and C is the fifth. G is the root of the dominant, B is the major third, and D is the fifth. The dominant is the chord that is most commonly expanded to a tetrad, and F is the minor 7th, and this chord is now G7. Before I explain the important thing about the dominant 7th chord, let me rearrange this a bit for you for simplicity and clarity on the guitar. First, let's drop the 5th, since it has very little harmonic function here. Let's transpose the root an octave down, and finally let's transpose the 7th an octave down. Now you see, and hopefully hear, that the interval between F the minor 7th and B the major 3rd is a tritone, three whole steps. There is tension in this interval, and it is pleasing to the ear that the tension is resolved by moving the 7th half a step down to E and B half a step up to C to the interval of a minor 6th. This resolution of tension uh, from the dominant 7th tetrad to the tonic triad is what drives harmonic music forward. There are of course countless variations of this in major and minor, but this is the basic secret in its purest and simplest form. On to A, the tonic parallel. A is the root, C is the minor 3rd and E is the 5th. And finally the odd one out, B diminished, the leading tone triad. B is the root, also called the leading tone because it has a strong affinity for leading melodically to the root of the tonic, C in this case. D is the minor third and F is the diminished fifth. Here's that same tritone interval again, so this is a very unstable chord and its function is usually an incomplete dominant seventh, uh, that is a dominant seventh with the root left out. And it leads just as strongly towards the tonic as the dominant seventh does. Before we move to minor let me just briefly explain secondary dominance. Let me use the example from earlier with the dominant G7 and the tonic C. Say we wanted to come into this G by resolving from what would be the dominant if we were in the key of G major, and that would be D7. In the key of C major, D is a minor chord, it starts out as the subdominant parallel. We raise the minor third to a major third, F sharp, and we lower the octave to the minor seventh. Now we have the tritone interval between the F sharp and C, and D7 is now the dominant of the dominant, and for a brief moment it sounds like we are in the key of G major. And the dominant D7 leads beautifully to G the tonic. The F sharp functions as the leading tone to G, and C goes half a step down to B, the third of the G major. We now have a major third between the two, the inverse interval of the minor sixth. But remember, we are actually in the key of C major, so we continue through the steps, lowering the octave to the minor seventh, and we have precisely the same situation as I explained earlier with the G7 resolving to C. So D7 was just a detour to make a more interesting and compelling case for moving to G, a secondary dominant. You can make them anywhere, 
but this is the most common one. And let me just briefly say something about parallel chord functions. Notice that in this major key, the parallel chords are all found a minor third below the non-parallel chords. And all non-parallel chords, save the leading tone triad, are major while all parallel chords are minor. In the key of minor, it's the other way around. A minor consists of precisely the same chords and notes as C major. They are parallel keys, although they have very much in common. When you name the intervals, with A being the tonic, they get different names from the major. B is the major second, C is the minor third, D is the fourth, E is the fifth, F is the minor sixth, and G is the minor seventh. Then the octave. These intervals define the natural minor, or the Aeolian mode. In the key of A minor, the chord A minor is the tonic. It's built up just like in major, so no difference there. The triad on B is the incomplete dominant seventh parallel, the C triad is the tonic parallel, the D minor triad is the subdominant, the minor triad on E is the dominant on F, the major triad is the subdominant parallel, and finally G is the dominant parallel. Now, I know what you're wondering. How can E minor function as a dominant? It can't, which is why we raise the minor seventh of the natural minor scale to a major seventh from G to G sharp. That scale is called the harmonic minor, because it makes for better harmonies since it now has a leading tone to the tonic. You can now have a tritone interval between G sharp, the major third, and D, the minor seventh. But of course, it resolves a bit differently since D leads down to C, the minor third of A minor, so it has a slightly less resolved feeling, slightly disappointing, not as happy about it as a major chord would be. If you think the harmonic minor scale is too funky with the augmented second interval between the minor sixth and the major seventh, then the solution is the melodic minor. It adds a major sixth to the harmonic minor. It's a slightly weird scale, but at least it consists of only whole steps and half steps. The newly introduced F sharp can naturally also be used as a leading tone to G from the natural minor, like with the secondary dominant in C major. I mentioned in last week's video that on the B7 I was applying the scale, but that wasn't entirely correct. It was a melodic minor with an augmented fourth, which is of course the major third, the D sharp in B7. Enough for this time. Too much of the stuff can temporarily boil your brains. Next time I'll continue with the song, completing the arrangement of the chorus and possibly adding parts, pre-chorus, post-chorus and whatnot. Thanks a million to the translator team at Ninja Translations and thanks a scrillion to my patrons on Patreon. You make my life worthwhile. If you feel terrible that you're not contributing to these videos, you can alleviate your suffering by clicking your way over to Patreon and signing up there. You'll get some cool things when you turn and even get to hang out with me on the monthly Google Hangout. See you next time.